Welcome to Redeem 2020 Ministries Friday Night Bible Study. I'm Jason Drake. Thanks for joining us. This is a great place to be. If you want to learn more about the Bible and how it applies to your life, we're going to go ahead and continue in Matthew chapter 7. It's a long one, but there's a lot of teachings of Jesus. We want to try and understand them through our study. We're going to talk tonight about how to recognize false teachers or false prophets. Get a piece of paper and a pen so you can take notes, and let's get into it. Hope you brought your Bible. And turn with me to Matthew 7. Once again, we're going to finish Matthew 7 this time. We're going to be looking at the last few sections. If you remember, Matthew 7 is the end of what Jesus is known as the Sermon on the Mount, or sometimes the Beatitudes or a number of different titles that are used. But the important thing is these are a collection of little messages that he delivered. And we'll find tonight, Jesus was talking to, in each of these short messages, he seemed to be talking to not just those who are listening, but certain groups, certain targeted groups of people that were following him or listening to him, and he, he knew they were tracking with him. So we, we sometimes feel like, well, I don't know, it's kind of like you step into a movie theater and, then, and, you, and you realize the movie's already gotten started. So that's the way some of these passages feel like. But Jose is with us. Good to see you tonight, man. Um, so what happens now is we're going to pick up the end of this section of verses because Jesus covers some, oh. uh, again, some important topics. So to, to get in your, in your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to start with verse 15. Before we start reading at verse 15, and we'll go through the end of the chapter, verse 28, 29, excuse me, the end of the chapter. I want you to, uh, as you look at these verses tonight, see if you can put together a thread, a common thread going through them, even though they, they may be perceived as being given at different times and not necessarily all at one moment or, or sitting. There's a thread through here, and I think it's because the author, I've mentioned this before, the, the writer we are assured of is Matthew, the tax collector, disciple, follower of Jesus. And Matthew was very interested in how the Jewish people would receive and understand these teachings of Jesus. Certainly, we look at them and how they fit within all of the gospels. So that's what we're also going to do tonight, as we did last week. We're going to look at verses in the other gospels that will cross-reference and help us to understand better what Jesus was talking about. And so it's important for us when we do Bible study to do that with your note-taking or whether you're, you're looking up things to research and understand. Now, I also want to, to point out to you that it's, also, it's becoming common today, today, right now today, when we see upheaval in the Middle East, especially in Israel, and with war against Israel, it's easy for people to begin to speculate, is this yeah. the time of the fulfillment of the prophecies regarding the end times? And there are certain things, there are hun a few hundred prophecies regarding the end times, the second coming of Jesus, and there are a number of differing opinions. You're going to either hear that in news reports or videos you read or pastors you listen to or even books that you may pick up to look to that have been recently written. And so this current situation, for those of you who will be watching this in the future, of uh, the conflict between uh, Hamas and its, uh, its political government in the area of Gaza and the government of Israel and the war that's going on between those two groups, it could also be characterized as really the war between Islam and Judaism. Those things are certainly prophesied in many ways. Even the prime minister of Israel, when he made a speech a few weeks ago, he referenced prophecies in 
the Old Testament prophets regarding the kind of activity, the kind of uh, violence and, and disruption that's going on. So that's another thing to keep, to be aware of when you listen to or talk about verses. Tonight, we're going to be looking at verses where Jesus talks about the day, the day. And in fact, it's a day where he discusses judgment. And so throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New, the day of judgment is often used to indicate a time, part of a timeline. If you were to put the beginning of all time at one end and Jesus coming again and establishing his reign at the other end, all throughout this, there are these references to the day of judgment. I'm not going to really try and give you a very big thorough discussion or study on what all those references mean and what they're, when, when that's going to happen, but be aware of what Jesus says is going to happen in the day of judgment. And so you'll need to pay attention to that. I'm sort of giving you my, my questions. We talk about how you should ask questions when you're doing Bible study. And so I'm kind of giving you some of my questions often that I'm thinking about as we go through the verses. All right. So let's get into it. Let me share my screen with you so we can begin to, dis to read and discuss tonight's segment of scripture. I titled this one, Know Them By Their Fruits. There are three different parts to our study tonight, but I thought this title would be uh, appropriate. Know them by their fruits. Before we even get started, I'd like for you to be thinking, what is this topic or title referring to when it says fruits? We see that reference in the scriptures as well many times, the term of fruit. And that's what Jesus is going to point out to us tonight. We need to be understanding about that. What does the Bible mean when it's talking about the fruits of someone? So let's get started with our first, uh, with just reading. I've got 15 through 28 in, in a, up here on the screen. Someone would please go ahead and read for us. You'll have uh, four screens to read through. So please get started. Whoever wants to read. I'll read. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. They are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or are, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. So every healthy tree bears a good fruit, but the diseased trees bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, I will, will, I, will, the, will, enter, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father, of my Father, who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat the, on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against that house. And it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Mm, okay. So tonight we're going to talk about these verses, and I've got three main parts to in this outline. The first is know them by their fruits. So that section that Jesus described and I want us to discuss. So think for a second how you might describe what that means, knowing someone by their fruits. The next we're going to talk about is how will Jesus judge, because that's a part of what he described. Uh, judging on the, the last day or on that day. And then the third is foundation for your life. And so that mm -hmm. those three sections are going to be part of our discussion tonight. Okay, let's go back and go back to the beginning of our segment here. And you can see that Jesus 
starts off with a warning. Uh, the word beware and beware, he's trying to warn the listeners, his followers, believers, those of us who he knows will be reading the scriptures later. Beware of false prophets. Now, let's stop for a moment. I don't want to ask anybody who'd like to just, you know, put on your microphone and share with us what you think. Why was Jesus warning them about false prophets? And before you answer, let me fill in the blank a little bit. There were a number of people, it seems, during the time of Jesus who were thought of as prophets. And so that kind of, that term seems like it was kind of a common perception that there are prophets that go around. But somebody please try and explain to us, why do you think Jesus was warning them about false prophets? Well, oh. Oh, go ahead. No, you're go fine. Ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was just going to say... Um, false prophets um to beware of them because their motives aren't right they have like bad intentions mm -hmm. um to steer people under the pretense of god but steer them in the way of um like in the evil way or to be bad or not to act loving like god um commands us to be to love one another but to act opposite of so they're under the guise of God, but their mm. motives and their intentions are not of that. Okay. All right. So you're, you're identifying a few things here, motives and intentions, <clears throat> and you're talking about behavior as well. But what is the concern about false prophets um, in terms of what Jesus claimed about himself versus those who make claims that he's now labeling as false. Well, um, I think it would be that they would lead them astray. Okay. So they're not leading them towards God. They're actually leading them away from God. Okay. Because like right. when you talk, for me, when we talk about their fruits, you want to recognize them by their fruits because to me, fruits are like your character or your yeah. morals or your values. All right. So if your morals and your character and your values aren't right, then yeah. it's a false prophet. Okay. All right. So now let me get you into the next question. Somebody else certainly can jump in to answer. Okay. What kind of fruits, if that's, if I think Jen has got a very good way of putting it here, uh, the fruits we're referring to. Uh, character issues that you can see, character issues you become aware of, character issues that happen to be, you know, um, evident about this person. So now, what kind of fruits would you say would lead you to consider a person to be a false prophet or a false teacher? Like hypocrites? Well, I think any, anyone that, uh, anyone that, that does things that go against the word of God um, all right. That you know, that's all. That's all we really have. When it comes to me, when I want to know something, you know, this world is so full of uh, lies and deceptions, and so really, the Bible is the only um, cornerstone I really have. At the end of the day, you know, people can lie to me through Photoshop and video editing and, or rumors. I can be fooled by a lot of things, but. If I know the word of God, I have that. Um, I can tell if somebody is with God or not just by reading his word. So if they go against that word, that solid foundation that I have, then I know yeah. that they're not they're not the right, you know, they're not legit. Okay. Very good. Like, okay. Somebody like else? Go ahead. April. Like un like ungodly characteristics. Like Okay. We're done. Like them having ways of being um, that are not in the way of God. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I want to sort of just uh, emphasize what Saul mentioned there with regards to, well, let me tell you something that's an, an, an analogy. I heard it said years ago that this was described. The FBI 
crime or law enforcement agency in the United States is actually a part of, or used to be part of the Treasury Department. And they were responsible for uh, trying to identify and, and uh, bring to justice people who were printing counterfeit bills, counterfeit cash. And it was then said that the way the FBI would train its agents who would go out in the field, of course, and have to deal with counterfeit bills that were being passed as real bills, of course, uh, the way that they would train them was not to try and show them all of the different counterfeit bills and teach them how to recognize which ones were good or bad. The way they trained those agents was by teaching them to so know and be so familiar with and schooled and trained with every detail of the real thing that they would instantly recognize a counterfeit. Mm -hmm. when, when Saul mentioned comparing to the standard of God's word, that's exactly what I believe is the same principle. When you get to know the real thing so well that you are, you have trained your thoughts, your mind, your 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 commitment to the person of Jesus, you will recognize someone right away who's counterfeit. Mm -hmm. Now, let me point out in this case another you know simple analogy here. Uh, in my house here, in our next to our house, we have some fruit trees planted. We have an apple tree, and we also planted about maybe 12 years ago, 13, 14 years ago, we planted a plum tree. And the plum tree has not produced good fruit. The plum tree has, in many years, it's not produced any fruit at all. But the times that it has produced fruit, when we picked them, they would have some kind of real funny looking bumps all over them that looked like they were, they were diseased. There was something wrong. We never ate them. <laughs> and we decided we're not going to trust these. And so it was easy to go to the tree that you had expected to find good fruit and look mm -hmm. at it and say right away, this does not look like a, a plum. This does not look like it's supposed to look. And we would check with other people who the one who actually gave us the, the, the tree, who had some of their own, and we could compare it to the good fruit that they were getting from their trees. It's like mm -hmm. our tree picked up a blight of some kind. Yeah. By the way, since it's not been producing good fruit now for several years, Last year, last uh, last uh, summer, or this past summer, I was getting ready to cut it down. Yeah. My my neighbor who gave it to us said, give it one more year. Give it one more year. I thought that was being merciful. Maybe that's a good example of the way God shows yeah. mercy. But the idea here is that Jesus taught about, about fruit. If you look at this section of verses in John 15, Jesus talks in here about the spiritual analogy to fruit so jesus was using natural principles the person who grows fruit the the orchard full of fruit trees which many people in my area have as well and then oh by the way when i first moved to orange county there were groves and groves of orange. oranges orange yeah. trees maybe you all remember those so as we look at the principles that a farmer would use when they found that they didn't have a, a, a tree that was producing well or producing consistently, they would give it some give it some nutrition, give it maybe some some extra attention. But if it didn't if it didn't respond and produce, they would cut it down. Jesus said that here in John fifteen. Jesus goes into a short explanation here that where he calls himself a vine, a true vine. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. That is the one who takes care of the groves of of tree, fruit. And so he says, if a branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and he prunes. By the way, we've done that with our trees as well. We prune them. And the following year, they grow back even stronger. I have blueberry bushes that we prune. There's all kinds of trees that need that kind of help and, and gardening and, uh, and management. And that's not hurtful or harmful to the tree. It actually is beneficial. It helps to improve airflow. It helps them to cut away the dead parts that are sucking life from the roots mm -hmm. and yet not producing. And so those are all principles that Jesus is referring to here. And he says, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself 
unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me, and I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Now, because Jesus used this analogy in John, and Matthew certainly was picking up on it, let's go back again to Matthew, and we can see where Jesus talks about the fact that the very last sentence here, if a tree does not bear good fruit, it's cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, let me add, let me add a, a word of caution here. We're going to talk some more about what Jesus is describing regarding the Day of Judgment. But it's not wise to try and take a reference here, one reference that says cut down and thrown into the fire, and try and draw a lot of interpretation about it because Jesus wasn't real specific here. He goes on, of course, just to give us the point of his message. The point of his message was, you've got to recognize people by their fruits. You've got to recognize teachers by their fruits, prophets by their fruits, people in leadership by their fruits. And that's why those who are, are aspiring to be leaders are held to a higher judgment, the Bible yeah. says. So. We need to uh, be, be very aware of what the real thing looks like, the real Jesus looks like, so that we can understand to what, what Jesus means by fruits. All right, let's move to the next part here. Now he says here, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now he's talking about, maybe this is an end times uh, prophetic, excuse me, I'm sorry. I didn't catch that quick enough to vote, mute myself here. All right. But he's talking about the third sentence or the second sentence. He says, on that day, many will say to me. Once again, Jesus does this a number of times throughout the Gospels where he uses the phrase on that day. And we know from Old Testament scripture as well as new that Jesus is talking about that God will bring a day of judgment. Acts 17, Paul, the apostle, preached this to non-believers even, to tell them that there is a day of judgment in which God will judge the world, judge the earth. So Jesus is coming up with a statement here. He doesn't tell us when. He's not giving us some kind of way of identifying when that day is going to be. And by the way, if anybody tells you they know when Jesus is coming again, Paul's done. They don't know. No, they don't. So the, Jesus says not even he knew, nor do the angels in heaven know. Certainly nobody uh, here on earth knows. There are plenty of people that can speculate. Okay. Now, let's look carefully, though, at what Jesus says about, once again, I think Jesus is talking here about the same topic of either false prophets or knowing people by their fruit. So here he says, first of all, he kind of clarifies and says, there are people who are going to come to him and call him Lord when they stand before him in judgment. But he says, some of them, not every other one of them, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he says, mm -hmm. the one who will enter the kingdom of heaven is the one who does the will of my father. We're going to kind of jump to that when we get to the end of our time tonight and expand a little bit on what that means. But on that day, that is the day when they stand before him, they will say to me, Lord, Lord. And then they describe these three things that they did. They prophesied in his name. They cast out demons in his name. And they did mighty works in his name. And Jesus is not impressed. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, the phrase, since we've been talking week, very, very uh, frequently week after week in the book of Matthew, the phrase, depart from me, you workers of, of, of lawlessness, comes from Jesus quoting the psalmist in Psalm 6, verse 8, in which that phrase was also used. But let's just take a, a minute here and talk about what Jesus was trying to say here and why would Jesus be acting or judging or in fact depart from me means that means you're not going to be in 
the kingdom of heaven. They're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why is he pointing out these particular actions that were done by these people regarding whether or not they're going to be entering into heaven? Someone share with me what your thoughts are regarding this statement of Jesus. Um, I, to me, when I read that that passage, um, to me, it tells me about false, false fake preachers, people who who never who, because it says, "Depart me, depart from me. I never knew you." And that's not talking about somebody who's who was saved because he he didn't say, "Depart from me. I knew you once, but now you've gone astray." It says, "I never knew you." So that means they were never true believers they were they were just they're faking yeah. stuff and for whatever motive they had um yeah. so to me that says that it's not it's not that hey you messed up and now you, you're not going to get to enter the kingdom it's you were never taking this seriously and yeah. you were you were to the people you could fool them but you can't fool god and so even though they think they might get you know through because hey i did a lot of good stuff um, and maybe they did. Maybe some of the stuff they did was positive. But if you don't have that true repentant heart and and the, and the Holy Spirit will, God can't save you. You know, he can't do that okay. work if you're if you're being fake. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts real briefly? Anybody else? Another thing, like when he says, by your fruit, we'll recognize, we'll know by your fruit. There is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, yeah, all the fruit of spirit. And yeah. many say, Oh, yeah, um, I, I love God, I'm a servant of God, but yeah, they don't live a godly life, a, a, a life with love, which you know, they don't have no joy in there. So, you know, you, you see that a man of God yeah. or a woman of God will recognize it because they live it every day. So, when they when the others speak and they say, Oh, yeah, I love God, not how you recognize by their spirit how do they live how do they react towards anything yeah. you know because a lot of times yeah. when they say oh yeah um i do this for god i do that but with no anointing you know the anointing comes through because of uh, your relationship with god it, it, it flows through you but you, you have to live pure one thing is pure before the lord and also yeah. like many false prophets they do things saying over oh, the people don't see me whatever but god sees it all you gotta use integrity you know and another thing is that when when we go to judgment we're gonna say oh yeah lord lord you know i love you lord i but he knows that you weren't serving him like you were supposed to so he that's what it says i know them by their fruit right yeah. and they're not gonna enter the kingdom of god why because he's gonna tell them I never knew you. You you not really show me. You know what I mean? So that's another thing is that you gotta be careful with that too. And many okay. study the word, no matter what they read the word, but yet they don't have a relationship with God. When they do they yeah. pray to God and God answers. We gotta remember one thing. God answers at his timing, it's not our timing. So okay. that's living a godly life. And another okay. thing when you said about the pruning, you know, without me, you are nothing. That's one other thing. When you get when you're God's pruning you, it's painful spiritually. You go through a lot of pain. Yeah. And then, yeah. like when you go through the fire, that's because He's refining you, removing yeah. all the uncleanness, all the lifestyle, the past lifestyle. He wants you to live godly, pure. Yeah. Amen. I got a lot to share, yeah. but next time. Okay. But okay. yes, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. thing. I, those, I think those are all those are all very good, and, and it's a it's it's apparent that we, as we've discussed already, Jesus is talking about by knowing them by their fruits, and it seems that Jesus is also describing here that uh, those whose fruit the fruits of their lives may not be, but he doesn't necessarily point out that uh, the the bad fruits of these people, the things that they claim to have done. Let me suggest one more thought, and this is not, this is not, I'm not, I'm not the, uh, the head theologian here in this local seminary, so just take uh, these thoughts as a, as an idea that might be possible, because we, we see, and I'm going to show you another place in scripture where Jesus talks about this same thing, but look and see if you will, what happens when these 
particular individuals characterized, it seems, by gen a general statement. They come to him as if they, Jesus is pointing out, whether or not they will enter the kingdom of heaven. So here they come and stand before Jesus as if they're trying to convince Jesus that they should enter the kingdom of heaven. And what reason are they giving for whether or not they should enter the kingdom of heaven? Now think for a moment. When I stand before Jesus, when you stand before Jesus, what am I going to say regarding whether or not he should be allowing me to enter the kingdom of heaven? I'm going to be on my knees. I'm going to be saying, Lord, I know that I was not worthy. I know that my life and my actions were not good enough, but you were. I, I am asking by faith, my faith in what you did, that that will give me your, grant me your mercy and favor and grace to enter the kingdom of heaven. Look what these particular individuals were using as the reason why they should be allowed in. What I did, what I did, what I did. I should be able to boast because look, I'm better than they, they others that were did not do these things. It's my good deeds, Lord. Don't you see? Didn't you see? Didn't you watch what I was doing all that time? Even if I did it for the sake of religion. And Jesus is going to say, you know what? You're still just a worker of lawlessness. You're just a sinner. And your sin is what you're now claiming or your behavior, your actions, your works is what you're claiming is the reason why you should be given entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's one of my thoughts regarding why Jesus would say something about people like this. Let's look real quickly at, I'm sorry, this verse in Matthew 25. I'm just going to summarize it for you. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, and he will sit on his glorious throne. This is at the end of Matthew in chapter 25. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people. One from another, as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Boy, those poor goat farmers that he was talking to must have been thinking, but Jesus, is that what you're saying? We're all goats are bad. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. I've skipped a few verses here. You cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will answer, Lord, when did you, we see you as hungry, thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick and in prison that did not minister to you? And he said, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And what Jesus is describing here, again, is another statement about the judgment day. The righteous will go into eternal life. Those who are not righteous will go into eternal punishment. Paul clearly, the Apostle Paul clearly says, the only righteousness we have, if you want to read through Romans 3 and Romans 4, the only righteousness we have is the righteousness that God transfers to us based on the death of and, and, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the only righteousness we have. So I just offer these particular verses to you about this issue of the judgment day. And keep in mind who Jesus was talking to and keep in mind what we see in the whole of scripture regarding righteousness before God and why our names, the Bible says in Revelation, our names will be those recorded in the book of life. Now, let me also go, now let's go back to the, our verses because I want to get covered quickly the third part here. Let me see. All right, here we go. In Matthew 7, the end, okay, everyone then who hears these words of mine, we're back in Matthew 7, and does them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. You've probably heard these verses and we've, just, we've discussed them at other times in the past. Uh, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had not been founded on the rock. That's the key phrase here I want you to pay attention to. Now, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them 
will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell, the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So Jesus here is talking about something we've discussed in the past is the foundation for your life. What is your life <clears throat> being based upon? What are you building your life upon? Are you building your life, your efforts, your choices, your relationships, your purpose, your goals, the way you measure and how am I doing? Are those things all based on what? You and your ability to get ahead, your ability to get a better job, make better money, uh, do the things that you want to do to try and maybe uh, even accomplish things. Jesus is saying, if you build your house on yourself, and what you think is the best thing to do, you're building your house on sand. And just like this story, this analogy, this sort of parable he's describing here, when the storms come, not if they come, we've talked about that many times, when the storms come in your life, and they will come hard, look at what one of the things that, that really uh, caught my attention is that it says the winds blew and beat on that house. There's other translations that say that it hits that house hard. You and I will. We are promised that we're going to go through tough times that will beat on you, that will beat on the foundation that you have laid. And like Saul mentioned when we first started, if you're, if you're going back to the scripture to compare, to compare the people that you listen to, to compare even Christian teachers, Bible teachers, pastor in front of the church, if you're not comparing, if you're not doing like Acts 17 says of the church believers there who went back to the scriptures to see whether or not what they were being taught was based on the Bible, then you're not building your life and your house on the, on the, the foundation that's going to not only stand up against the storms, but that's what Jesus is saying he's going to be looking at in the last day. Look at this one here in James. The, the book of James was written by James, Jesus' brother, who believed and became a leader in the church. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. That is, if you're only a hearer, you're deceiving yourself. And he further describes what he means. For if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like a person who looks intently at their natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, that means you keep with it, you stick with it, you commit yourself to it, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed. God will show his grace, his favor to one person, a person who does, does this. Don't just be someone who reads the, the word and walks away and ignores it. But it, it needs to be like a mirror showing you who you are in comparison to what God says is right. It's like the agent looking at a counterfeit bill. You need to be looking at the real thing, Jesus himself. And that's what you should be comparing yourself to. And so in the verses we started off with, one of the things that uh, I made note of was that Jesus said, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, I'm going to finish with one verse. If there's any question about what God's will is, let me show you. First John 3, the Apostle John writes, this is his commandment. Okay, you're unclear those who are listening, and maybe you're listening to this later on. This is his commandment, God's commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Christ, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. This is what God's commanded. This is the fruit that should be showing in our lives. And that's what we think and uh, know for sure is how we should be building our life on the foundation of what Jesus taught and the person of Jesus, trusting in the person of Jesus, and not just uh, not just trying to figure things out on my own, but trusting him. Okay, let's go to a time now just sharing. I have a, we have a few minutes. 
If someone would like to share some thoughts or questions about what we studied tonight, please go ahead, put your microphone on and share with us any other thoughts. Well, I think uh, it's, it's very uh, reassuring that God is not counting on my actions to let me into heaven because if that's really, you know, as the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that you have to do a certain amount of actions or you can't get into heaven or you can't, I mean, whatever they believe, um, then it would be very difficult, you know, and, and when you see them knocking on doors every Saturday and walking around, it's because they believe it's their de salvation depends on them. So it's understandable that they're very insistent on it. But the truth is that, you know, the, the Bible says we're not good enough and only through being cleansed through the blood of Jesus can we reach heaven. The, and, the, and the real question is, you know, what rewards will you get in heaven? Because I, I believe the Bible says that you will get rewards in heaven and you may enter heaven and not get any rewards because you didn't do much. No, um, but um, you'll still be in heaven. But, you know, I'd, I'd rather face God and and be able to at least show my my faith after he saved me, you know, show my gratitude and what I at least try to do. But that definitely will not get me into heaven. It'll it'll I already be there through my faith and um i just think it's really reassuring because it's it tells in these verses it's kind of telling us it doesn't matter how good you are you're not going to get into heaven that way well that tells me that it doesn't the reverse might also apply it doesn't matter how many times you mess up god's going to have mercy on you because you know it's the blood of god the power of the blood of god that gets you through it and not your ability yes Okay, good, thank you. Anybody else want to add any comments? Any thoughts? So what comes to my mind right now, Jason, is that one, and I can't remember the scripture, when um, two guys go to the altar and one guy's talking about all the good stuff he did, but the, the guy next to him has his head bowed and he says, forgive me, Lord, I'm a sinner. That's one that gets to me right now in regards to what we're, uh, you're teaching right now. And when I think about things, you know, I mean, I think that's true because this, I mean, the word of God is what's, what's kind of changing and molding all of us. And just like you said earlier, we know the truth by the word. And like, if I'm receiving the word, exposing myself to the word, but revealing other traits about me, then that kind of shows that the word's really not having its impact on me. And a lot of times I see that out there too, where I see people proclaiming to be Christians and so forth. But then as you're looking at them, they're not really doing Christian like things. And I only say this because for myself, I always got to be careful with myself. You know what I mean? Because um, it's been a, quite a journey for me. You know what I mean? And I know that through God's word, through learning God's word, that's what's always convicting me when I, I make a wrong turn and stuff. You know and I mean, and that's why I'm even here right now to this Bible study. So I could put myself like in the fire to stay straight, keep my eyes on Jesus and so forth. And when that time comes for me, I'm going to probably be like that guy that's, that's looking down and just hoping for God's mercy. You know what I mean, because there's nothing I could possibly do to turn my salvation because according to the word of God, the way I'm learning it, Jesus did it all for us, but I, that's not for me to take for granted. You know I mean, but I still go through those motions, you know what I mean? And God's word still convicts me. And, you know, it's, I think it's a good thing, you know, because, uh, you know, God reveals to me his mercy all the time because I'm still here. He gave me another day. Amen. Good. All right. Well, good. Thank you. Um, so this is a, this is a, the end of our study in chapter seven of Matthew, and we'll continue on through the stories of the Gospels. I'm glad we just took it verse by verse because there's so many of these things that I wanted us to discuss and understand when you're reading through the scriptures after you've studied a portion of scripture, now it becomes more clear and you begin to understand as, as you see these things that Jesus is teaching and talking about being uh, being things that he brings up in various ways so this is a way of building our faith your faith and as anthony said too and as we read in james when you listen to god's word 
and God's spirit begins to speak to you about something in your life that you know is not right, then you need to, on your knees, get, get, get right before God over all the issues that he brings up. Did you miss our Bible study last week? Or would you like to listen to other previously recorded studies with topics that will encourage you in your faith and help you to understand the scriptures even more? Go to our website, redeem2020ministries.org. Click on Bible study in the menu at the top of the screen, and there you'll find our section where we have listed previously recorded studies.